It has been brought to our attention that depending on the platform that you listen to, you can no longer hear some of our previous episodes. Some of our favorite episodes. Some of the ones where people would reach out and say, hey, listen, I can't believe that you talked to insert whatever name here. And honestly, it makes us a little sad that you can't go back in time and have a listen because the stories were really incredible. We reference a lot of times, oh, we had a chance to talk with so-and-so in the past. And if you can't go back, then it's kind of just, oh. So we wanted to bring some of those guests, some of those former guests back into the spotlight. We're going to call it like a, a rerun, I think. A Why Me Project rerun. Do you remember those? I do. Back in the day, or you used to throw the tape into the VCR and <laughs> oh, we're dating ourselves. We are, but uh, a rerun was the opportunity to rewatch one of your favorite episodes. Now everything's so accessible. Well, we thought it was. Yeah, exactly. So without further ado... Here's your Why Me Project rerun. This week, we have a special guest. I've been following this man's career for quite some time. I remember him actually playing uh, here in Edmonton years ago at a festival called Harvest Moon. Whoa, that is a, a way back flashback. A blast from the past, mm -hmm. if you will. Let's welcome this week's guest... Toby Morell, how are you? Doing really good. How about you guys? Oh, good. Thank you. We like to ask this skill testing question because we never know where it's going to go. Toby, who is Toby and where did you come from? Grew up in Greer, South Carolina. That kind of predicted what kind of person I'd be. Most people think I sound and look like a redneck, but uh, <laughs> I don't think I'm that way. I think I'm a little bit, a little bit more open and uh, try open to new things. So uh, I think I ended up being a, a strange music artsy nerd in a very uh southern world you know i grew i grew up with people liking country music and rap music and that was it and i was like there's got to be something more than that and so once I, I was able to get to college i found out it was more listening to christian music was that a thing growing up or you didn't even have that avenue either i didn't really listen to christian radio i, I mean it was there but to be honest i never really listened to christian music it, it just didn't resonate with me i always kind of struggle with that. I know a lot of people really like it a ton. For me, it just, uh, I, I couldn't, it, did, it didn't uh, ev evoke emotions the way it did with other people, I guess. So I, I, I always liked like old hymns, but once some of the new stuff started coming out, maybe like in the 90s and, you know, n newer things, and I, I know there was music, new Christian music even in earlier times than that, but that's when I was listening. Uh, I just, just gravitated towards more secular music. When did you realize then that you had a talent and that music was a huge passion of yours? Really early on, I noticed that, uh, like, even at church, I was getting solos. Like, they would ask me to sing the solo or to start a song because I could always pretty much get the right pitch or something like that. So I knew right away, pretty early, you know, maybe by five or six years old, that I, I was at least a good singer. And then uh, as I got older and older, more people, teachers, uh, college professors and stuff told me that I had a, a good voice. And from that too, though, I just all, I, I mean, probably by the time I was eight years old, I just loved the idea of writing my own music. I liked other people's music and, and being informed by that and inspired by that. But really early on, eight, eight or nine years old, I would just try to poke out a few notes on the piano and just, my first song I ever wrote was called, I love you. I love you always and forever. We'll always be together. And I thought I wrote a hit. I thought that was... <laughs> Sounds like a Robert I Munch book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, when it came to you then, uh, I mean, if you would have predicted where you are now, was music the path that you wanted to choose? Or did you think that you'd grow up and, you know, Toby would become a doctor or Toby would become a fireman? Well, it's funny. When I was little, the only college that I ever saw or, or heard people talk about, like on you know, TV shows or anything, was Harvard. So I was like, I guess that's where I'm going. I'm going to go to Harvard one day when I was little. <laughs> little did I know what it actually was. And, you know, so I, I realized by the time I got to high school, there was no chance of that. <laughs> I, I was always really intrigued, too, by entertainment. Like, uh, I remember being in middle school and the talent show, I did a stand-up comedy act. So I kind of thought I might could do something like that. I, I would have loved at that time to maybe end up doing comedy or getting on Saturday Night Live or something like that. Music just kept getting easier and better, and I was joining local bands and stuff like that. So I thought, yeah, this is the right way to go, and I, and I was good at it. I liked writing songs, and I was getting better at writing music. I don't know if I ever imagined this, but I definitely imagined myself being successful in music. 
Would you describe yourself then growing up and in grade school as one of the class clowns or one seeking attention? Yep, 100%. I, w- I was kind of the chubby kid, and so I had to make up for insecurities of myself with, like, being the funniest kid. You know, I, I got voted uh, class clown or uh, funniest kid in class or whatever in high school and everything. So that that was definitely – it was almost like a defensive mechanism, but also it helped me – like, I always view comedy as a way to get past certain people's, you know uh, – walls and stuff like that like if you can make somebody laugh eventually they'll probably be your friend so that's what i did from early on so yeah i was definitely a class clown so as you were in uh, you were in different bands growing up was emory then kind of the the hit that you guys thought that it was going to be well it, it took a while even with emory i mean we were in in college we were in uh, a band called joe 747 and some of the other guys in emory were in a band called simply wayne and we were all friends, and we would play shows together. But in South Carolina, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, nobody cared about our music. It was still like Dave Matthews or Hootie and the Blowfish, you know, <laughs> college rock stuff. <laughs> nobody cared about us playing long, drawn-out emo songs or heavy songs, or especially they didn't care about screaming or anything like that. Once college ended, several of us from both bands said, hey, let's just make a go of it. And we went out to Seattle. We moved as far away as we could from South Carolina. <laughs> That way we wouldn't have to, you know, we wouldn't have anything to fall back on. Like, I, I thought if we stayed in South Carolina, I got my degree in elementary education. I thought, well, if it doesn't happen within a few months, I'll probably convince myself just to go ahead and start teaching. I'll give up. So we thought, let's move out to Seattle as far as we can, away from everybody, and just only have each other in the music. And so that's what we did. So making that huge commitment, we thought, well, that at least gave us a fighting chance. And then our music got better. Like, moving across the country, we were hearing, like, at, at the time, Seattle, the local scene had a lot more... Uh, I almost want to call it like pop punk fast music. And we were playing like long six, seven minute emo songs. And so moving out there sped up our music a little bit, made us, we couldn't come up after three punk bands and play, you know, long instrumental songs and just drawn out. <laughs> it, just, it just wasn't working. Culture shock definitely shocked us, made our songs a little bit more tight. We kind of got a little bit more confident in shorter songs. And then, yeah, I think once we recorded our album, we saved up, uh, we all lived in what we call it like a commune. We basically lived in a, tiny little house with a garage and it was like seven guys and some of us slept in the one bedroom some of us slept in the garage and uh we saved up enough money to record an album on our own we recorded it and then shopped it around and then tooth and nail when they heard it we're like yeah we want to sign you guys and then i I would say we thought we would do good but the you know our first week for our first record was the biggest first week of any record in tooth and nail history like we and that's not i mean it's not like unreal it was only probably two or three thousand but our album first week was the biggest one at the time. Wow. So that that was kind of a, a huge boost. We're like, whoa, this is really cool. People are liking this. It's interesting that someone growing up who didn't necessarily gravitate towards Christian music ended up releasing Christian music. That's, that's what's funny. A lot of people don't think it is Christian music. Oh. <laughs> well. I mean, a, lot, a, lot of people, a lot of people think uh, Emory and so why, why wouldn't we be more clear when we're talking about God or why do we sing about relationships? A lot of our lyrics are about relationships, but... Our whole goal was we always felt like it, it felt more real to write about what I actually was going through and what I know. Like mm-hmm. that, that a, a lot of times I felt like uh, the Christian music was very low bar. It was trying to be encouraging. It was trying to give you a message, and I didn't have to wrestle with it. So I'd rather write a song where somebody goes, what is he talking about? Why is he saying that? What does he mean here? What, I mean, why is he screaming? Like, I love that idea. One of the favorite things from the Bible is Jacob wrestling in God. What a weird, strange part of the bible where it's just you're wrestling god and then he you know kind of cheap shots you and throws your hip out or whatever <laughs> like like <laughs> all that stuff's really interesting you, you need to think about that like it, i just like the idea of writing lyrics and you think about it it's funny our last record even um you were never alone every single song is a story from the bible but it will never probably get played on christian radio nobody will ever listen to it because it it you have to think about it you have to it doesn't it necessarily say god like you know there's Every single story is straight from the Bible. The very last song is about, you know, Jesus dying on the cross. And I don't know if anybody wants to spend the time to really think about it and wrestle with it. So that, But that defines our band. I want you to wrestle with it. I want you to go, man, I don't like that. Or, or why does he say that? Or, man, I do love that. You know, I think that's way better wrestling with stuff than it just being kind of fed to you in the simplest way. 
it frustrate you as a as an artist though because i mean it, it was this ongoing fight and i remember it being kind of when you guys were uh, making your way up there was uh, under oath or demon hunter where it was the are you christians in a band or are you a christian band and nobody wanted to be put in a box was it frustrating for you guys as a band um yes and no i think in one way we i think the culture on both sides, secular music and Christian music, pushed these bands, like especially Tooth and Nail bands, that way because they wanted an answer. What are you? Are you Christian? Are you not Christian? What is that? And it, it's never really that black and white. Of course, I'm a Christian, but at the same time, what am I just writing music for Christians? And and if so, what does that even mean? Like, what what are we saying here? Like, what, it, we we're we're going to create a whole. Uh, genre of music just for a certain group of people like I just I didn't like that so in one way we were forced that way and then the other I didn't really care I mean I, I don't care what you think if you, you might say you know we're a Christian Christians in a Christian band we're a Christian band we're an emo band we're a sucky band whatever you want to say <laughs> that's, that's kind of up to the listener yeah, I, I know that it's a, it was an ongoing thing that people just were so tired of having the the conversation about it. But I mean, you're a, a band who would then go uh, uh, festivals. You would go and you'd play at bars. Was there added pressure for you guys, or did you see it as a better opportunity? Well, we were. Uh, this might have even been before we were signed or getting close. This is, this is really early on in our career. We got on a tour that was a church tour. And so we got to play, like, I don't know, it was a short tour, maybe five, ten days, something like that. But uh, I can remember we were playing these shows, and here's what it felt like to me. And I know it's not uh, this might be way different for other bands, but for us in Emory, this is the way it felt for me, was I was going to a church show, and nobody really cared about the music. It was just a safe place where parents could drop off their kids and not have to worry about them for a couple hours. And this band was Christian, so it was safe. Uh, kind of that same idea, again, of not wrestling with music. You don't have to think about it. Well, these guys are Christians. Everything's safe. I don't have to worry about my kid being at a bar, which I totally understand. And I have kids, too. And, and I mean, I think it's fair, and parents can raise their kids however they want. But the thing, as a band and as an artist, I just felt like, do these kids even care about our music? It, it feels like some weird youth group thing that isn't about the art or the music at all. So much so that by about the fourth show, I can remember walking out after the show and just walking out in this big field that was beside this church in Oregon, and I just looked up and I said, God, this doesn't seem right. I, I don't think we can play at churches, which it seems hilarious that we are Christians. And I'm saying we're not, we can't play in front of these people. But it was almost like the Holy Spirit was just letting me know, don't do this. Like, if, if you really do care about your art and honoring God with your art, take the chance. Maybe the people will think you're too Christian in a bar. Maybe they won't like it, but it'd be way better to fail the way that I felt was authentic rather than have a career and, you know, be in this. Uh, system that doesn't really even like your music necessarily. I'm kind of curious. You went to college, kind of seemed like a game changer year for you. Well, not year, but for your degrees. Were your parents really encouraging and supportive of you moving to Seattle to pursue music, or did they want you to pursue the teaching angle of life? Yeah, they weren't encouraging at all. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't understand it. I'd gotten my degree in elementary education, and they were, I mean, I won't go in, I won't make them look too bad, but it wasn't nice, some of the things they said. My mom may be more encouraging a little bit, but still didn't understand it. And and I'll give them a little bit of a break here. They didn't understand the music we were doing. I'd always grown up having a really good voice, so why in the world? They were like, why are you screaming, <laughs> hollering, and playing that rock music? So I, I do understand from that perspective, but – and also it seems dangerous to them. You know, growing up in small towns, Greer, South Carolina, moving to a big city like Seattle, what in the world are you doing? Why do you have to do this? Why do, you know? But I knew what we had to do. I knew I had to take that chance. And so it, it slowly won them over, you know. I mean, they, they still never really understood or liked it, and our music wasn't really ever on the radio, so they didn't get it. Um, it was funny. Uh, what was the name of that TV show? The, the one time my parents, I think when I finally won them over, was our song got played in a commercial, uh, uh, that TV show, Prison Break. Oh, yeah. My dad okay. finally called me. You know, it was years later after we'd moved. This is like, you know, we moved out there in 2001, and uh, my dad called me in like 2006, 2007. It was like, I heard your song on that TV show, Prison Break commercial. I can't believe it. And I was like, oh, okay. Now, so <laughs> he didn't care about the hundreds of thousands of records sold anyway, but as long as we got on that commercial, validated that maybe I made a right decision. <laughs> so you're, uh, you, you said you have kids. How many, how many little ones you got? We have three. They're they're pretty little. We got a uh, actually our littlest birthday was yesterday. Uh, she turned five. 
We have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Have you thought about how you're going to parent when it comes to your kids and what they're listening to? Uh, we've talked about this a lot, my wife and I, and my friends who have kids and stuff too. I, I just want to – here's one thing I think. I believe oftentimes we protect our kids a little bit too much and kind of do that helicopter parenting thing where we go, they can't handle it, they can't handle it, they can't handle it. And then uh, they end up being, you know, 20 years old and being exposed to stuff, and maybe they can't at that point. We never gave them an opportunity. So I'm I'm going to be careful about certain things, but at the same time I like pushing the envelope a little bit and exposing my kids to what real culture is and what the real world is and treating them like humans because I think they can handle it. Now, some stuff they can't. We're not, there's certain movies and TV shows we're not going to allow them. There's certain music that's just too much, of course. Even a little caveat here, too. I'm fine with however any other parent wants to raise their kid. I think, you you know, you had that kid, and I think you can do a great job, and you might never let them listen to anything. That's totally fine by me. But with my kids, I, I just felt like I was so – I grew up very, very conservative Pentecostal. The church I went to, women couldn't wear jewelry or cut their hair or wear jeans. Uh, you couldn't go see movies. I mean, it was – you know, they – uh, it, it was very serious, and I felt like it kept me away from understanding people and understanding culture. And if God is, is real and as strong and as big as we say he is as Christians, I think we can handle a lot more uh, than what people. I think we should give our kids a little bit more credit and expose them to stuff and say, hey, this is why this is weird. or This, this might not be healthy to listen to. I'm showing you this to say, I mean, you might like this beat, but man, it sure is disparaging to women. Or you might like this uh, rock song, but oh my gosh, what is he saying about this person or this? Or, you know, what language is he using? I think we can expose our kids to that and it not be a thing that makes them immediately turn pure evil and, you know, write 666 on their hand or something. Like that. <laughs> Now, I, I've been following you guys for a number of years. Uh, one thing that I really admire about you is that you seem to have a, a lot of different avenues that you go, whether it's music or you are a part of a Bad Christian podcast. Why do you think that that podcast is so successful? Well, I think once again, early on, we decided we got to just be ourselves. We wanted to capture three friends talking like they really do. And I think oftentimes people are really scared of that. They want an image or a thing to look to. Uh, to be inspired by, and I, that, that always lets you down. When we, like, if you lift up a pastor and say, oh, man, he is holy and good, and he's the man that we should all imitate and be like, usually they're going to let you down because they're just a real human, and everybody will. I never understood why we had to hide so much. For example, like I said, when we were growing up in the conservative church, you couldn't go see movies. Going to see a movie at a movie theater was wrong. They've changed since then, obviously. But So we would sneak across town 45 minutes, so we knew we could go see a movie, my family would, so we, nobody from our church would see us. Hmm. And in the early age, I mean, I'm seven years old, and I'm realizing, this doesn't seem right. What are, what are we doing here? Is it okay to see a movie, or isn't it? Why would I want to present a picture of me where you're like, man, that Toby guy is just a great man. Oh, wow, he always does, you know, and his marriage is awesome, and his language is awesome. And this is also, that, that doesn't really give you the whole picture of me. I'd rather you go... I don't know about that guy. He, he's pretty funny. Sometimes he says right stuff. A lot of times he says a lot of bad stuff and wrong stuff. That That's a complete picture. So you don't ever get an idea of me that I'm super great or somebody to always look to. Like, I have some good ideas. I, I say some things that are right, and I say a lot of stuff that's wrong. I'd rather you see that real picture than not. And that's what the Bible does. That's what I think so <laughs> That's what I can't understand. What is everybody hiding so much? The Bible, almost all the characters have terrible flaws. Just terrible flaws. And it's recorded in history in the most read, published book in the history of the world. And God uses the people that are, like, kind of messed up. They're a little jacked up. they got some stuff crazy going on with them. And that's because that's real. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's real. I mean, a, a man after God's own heart, David, and also had wives and killed people and killed, uh, you know, that she was husband, all this stuff. Like, all that is captured because that's a real person. You, you, you know that David did a lot of good things. And he made a lot of mistakes, too. At what point, looking back over your life, did you make that transition from that rule-based life into more an authentic Christian life and, you know, being, like you said, just more real? From, you know, from rules to real, when did that happen for you? Probably around 10th, 11th grade, my family always said, you got to stay away from alcohol, you got to stay away from cigarettes and cussing and all this stuff. But about that time, I started really clearly realizing, wait, all my friends are doing these things, and they're cool, and it's not destroying them. They're still making good grades, and they're still doing good. I was like, is it really that bad? So I, But because I hadn't been exposed to it, because my family did none of those things or never talked about them, 
I just went full in. So I kind of went, I changed from a good little Christian guy to kind of like a party guy. You know, I was smoking weed, drinking, partying. My grades started failing. I started doing pretty bad in school. So I kind of kept that up for a while, maybe, you know, two, three years. I got into college, but still partied really hard. Kind of just had a moment where God found me. And it sounds cheesy and cliche, but that it's the most thing I can say to prove God is that he proved himself to me. Like when I wasn't really looking for God, when I wasn't trying, he reinitiated our relationship and was like, hey, here I am, and let's see where this goes. And, and so that happened. And so from there, I realized, wait a minute, the rules thing didn't work. That wasn't even God. The, the whole rules thing isn't God. That's a, a system that you follow to make yourself look good or think you're doing something. Following God is way, way different. There's a lot of, you're going to break rules. There's, I don't know, a lot of times the rules are crazier than you thought or more strict than you thought or more loose than you thought. And so that is where I started back from. I was like, I can't go back to just a rules, authority, authoritarian God. That, it didn't work for me. It, it didn't feel like God. God wants me to sometimes, like I said, wrestle with him, not understand him, cry out, like, where are you? What are you doing? How can this be? God, you're, you're God and this is happening in my life? Like, I, I like that wrestling and fighting, and that is real pursual of God. I love hearing your commitment with just encouraging people to ask the questions, to wrestle with God. So let me throw the question out to you. Have you had any why me moments, whether it be a positive one or one where you're just really grappling with where you're at? Yeah, I probably had those uh, weekly or monthly. <laughs> but some of the but some of the ones, that, that, like the big ones are, you know, like I, I worked at a, the, uh, a mega church called Mars Hill in Seattle. I was working at this church, and I felt so on fire, and I was so challenged, and still have been. I, I'll say that I walked away with more than I ever would have lost or anything like that. But that church crumbled, and it's gone now. And I was like, God, what is, what is this? Is, is it just a show? Is it? I mean, why, why would a whole church that was becoming one of the most influential churches, if not in America, in the world, maybe even? And it was gone. And then I moved to a, 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 through a course of events. I felt like I was supposed to go to another church and become a worship leader and small group leader. And uh, same thing, really enjoyed my time there. Love the people there. I think they're great and awesome. But they were just stirring in me. like what? And I, just couldn't, I couldn't reconcile, am I supposed to quit church? I mean, this is what I was supposed to do, right? Like, I, I'm a singer. I'm a good worship leader. I, I was caring about small groups and leading small groups. And so I, what is going on? And each of those times, it felt like, seriously, the Holy Spirit was telling me to quit church. That's what it felt like. And uh, so eventually I was like, yeah, I just have to. I have to listen to this and see what this is. I don't want to quit God, but whatever this system is, it's kind of, it's, I don't know if I'm burnt out. I don't know what I'm thinking here, but I'm not adding to the vision of this church. I'm not, uh, even though I'm doing a good job, it doesn't, I don't know if I'm fully on board with where they're headed. And I, they need somebody that is. I need to step out of here and let somebody, you know, there's a person that I'm taking their job that might do a better job of me just because their heart is in it and passionate. So those things for sure, I think that was some of the big things. And then on a personal level, uh, two, three years ago, my wife um, got breast cancer. And that was one where I just couldn't, I couldn't quite understand how this happened. And because I'd always, you know, you always hear people with, they get, get cancer or diseases and stuff like that. Why me? Would it? But at this, I was like, God, this is my wife. And we're trying and we're doing all this stuff. And, and she has breast cancer. And so I, and I didn't want to acknowledge it. I was just like, oh, it'll be fine. You know, babe, everything's going to be fine. We'll figure this out. And I, and I couldn't even hardly go there. I couldn't allow myself to feel it because I was like, I'm the man. I have to be strong for her, mm -hmm. to be strong for my family. I have to be encouraging. I can't let her think that I'm scared for her or that what if she could die? Like, I can't even reveal that. And uh, I realized, wait a minute. My wife's not getting to see the side of me that's scared to death, that's frightened this worried, this mad at God. My, I'm not showing this to my wife. She thinks I'm, I don't even think her cancer's that serious, apparently. You know? And so I was like, what? whoa, 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 what? hold on. And then, so with that, I was able to, like, have a release and, and, and be mad at God. I, I think that's okay. God is so big and so good and awesome that he wants us to, like, why would I hold back my anger from God? Why would I only show him, oh, I love you, God, and you're awesome, I'm going to worship you. No, I, why wouldn't I be mad at God? I'm mad at my best friends in the world, my wife, we get mad at each other. That's real. So why wouldn't I say, even if I'm wrong, I think God's okay with me being really upset or mad or not understanding. And so I, I, if 
find now that it's okay for me to be mad at God and, and, and yell out and yell at him and go, what are you doing? Aren't you God? Aren't you him that delivers everybody and does all this stuff and I'm here? Because that's all I have. I have this experience in this life. And so if I'm not real with God, then what's the point? How's your wife now? She's good. She's good. She had to have a double mastectomy. Um, and, you know, that not only physically but mentally, emotionally, it's been a lot for her to overcome. And she's super strong and has done come such a long way. I mean, I'm uh, she's like one of the heroes of this life because of how strong she is. But mm-hmm. um, she's doing good, and the cancer is completely gone. She has to get checked up, you know, probably like once every six months still. But um, she's doing well and is healthy. Last one for you. There's rumors that you guys are working on a new Emory project. Uh, what can we expect? Yes, we are. We're working on it right now, uh, trying to get it done, actually. Uh, I would say I think it's going to be a still aggressive, uh, heavy Emory, but maybe with less of, you know, chugga-chugga breakdowns. <laughs> uh, I, think, uh, you know, I think it's going to be more aggressive in a way that, you know, it moves you, and at the same time you're listening to music that maybe your parents could – could understand even or something like that. that that doesn't mean it's not going to be rock and roll it's going to be rock and roll and heavy but i think we're taking a there's definitely a i hate saying maturity because that's what everybody says as they get older and they're on their later records but <laughs> it is more it is more mature in a sense of we're confident in who we are so we're not trying to uh just appease the fans i want to i want i want our fans to love this music but at the same time we're confident in who we are and what we're creating so i think it's going to be uh, i mean i really so far, the demos and songs that we have are just so good, and you're going to be, you know, bobbing your head to them, and you know, it's, it's kind of a little dancey, a little rocky, all kinds of that stuff. At uh, Toby Toby Joy Joy, as well as uh, official Emery on Twitter and at Bad Christian Pod. Toby, we appreciate you taking a minute and uh, chatting with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Thank you for tuning in to an old episode, a past guest of our Why Me Project rerun. Something that we're starting now because there were so many episodes that we really did love and they've kind of disappeared from the digital world. And speaking of digital world, I did a little recon. There are at least nine different platforms in which you can listen to the Why Me Project podcast. Okay. So there's no excuses, but I mean, some of the main ones like Apple Podcast and or Spotify. And you could always head to our social media accounts to stay up to date as each and every Wednesday we have a brand new episode for Why Me Project. And you can also let us know if there's someone that you would like to hear on a future episode. At Why Me Project on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Why Me Project at Outlook.com. <laughs>